Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started uh, in our class today, let's uh, have a few moments of silent prayer. Make sure we're ready to study the Word and ready to focus. And God, the Holy Spirit, can use it to advance us in our spiritual growth. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, again, we're thankful that we can come together to study your Word, to be refreshed and encouraged as we... Uh, look at this epistle that was written so many uh, centuries ago, and yet the truths that are here are as important and as timeless as they were when they were written, and they are specifically or especially true uh, today in light of the uh, similar cultural context between uh, our day and that of the writing of this epistle. And Father, we pray that as we study, we'll, you'll be keep, help us to keep out the distracting thoughts that easily interfere with our focus and concentration, and that God the Holy Spirit will help us to understand what we study and see how we as believers can apply it to be strengthened in our own spiritual growth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, last time we began this uh, study in the epistle of Jude, and we saw that the main idea in Jude was to contend for the faith. This is his main message In verse 3, everything that he says comes back to understanding why it is important for us to contend for the faith. The Greek word that is translated contend was a word that was often used in the context of athletic contests, the context of of, uh, wrestling or fighting or boxing, running, any of these contexts where there was uh, a challenge and uh, some obstacle that needed to be overcome. And so what we see is the importance that uh, is stressed in the Word of God for maintaining doctrinal accuracy and doctrinal purity because there is all, are always those who come into the congregation, come into any, uh, the, any, any sort of theological group and have ideas that aren't orthodox, that don't stay with the Scriptures. There's always a challenge to the sufficiency of Scripture, sufficiency of grace, sufficiency of the cross, there are always challenges to understanding uh, how we understand the Scripture. And hermeneutics are uh, the tremendous battlefield today. So we have to always contend for the faith. This is part of the, the area of theology that is usually referred to as apologetics. It doesn't have to do with apologizing for something, but it has to do with giving an answer for the hope that is in us, why we believe something is true. And if you just think about it, the, the, the whole statement that I believe this is true indicates a certain view of truth and that whatever is referred to by this, whatever he puts into that formula, I believe X is true, whatever X is, then we have to have a clear understanding that that relates to a specific set of statements, set of propositions, set of beliefs. And so that's what we have to contend for is those, those basic propositions that are foundational, fundamental to Christianity. And I think that you can even divide these into uh, different levels of significance. You would have your primary uh, truths, such as the Trinity, the infallibility and the authority of Scripture, because without that, you have nothing. If there's anything in here that's fallible, then what, what is and what isn't? What is the criteria for determining what is wrong and what isn't? Uh, what's the ultimate uh, arbiter of truth, and that has to be God. And God, to be God, by very definition, has to be able to preserve and keep his word accurate. And in coming from him, it has, it has to be inerrant to begin with, 
And then even though it comes through fallible, fallen human writers, God is able in his omnipotence to preserve and protect the writing of Scripture. So that this gives us the body of faith. So we talk about God, we talk about the authority of Scripture, uh, who Jesus Christ is as the eternal second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, what he did on the cross in terms of dying for our sins as our substitute, that salvation is not by works but by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. We don't add anything to faith. We don't add anything to the work of Christ uh, upon the cross. These are foundational, fundamental uh, beliefs that make up the faith. Then I think there are some... um, many other doctrines that are just a shade less foundational than those and that are also extremely important to maintain related to uh, the doctrines related to the church as the body of Christ, the distinction between uh, Israel and the church, uh, many other doctrines that come along, and that all makes up the faith, the doctrine that has been passed on and down through the, the, through the centuries. And when we talk about the development of doctrine, we're not talking about the fact that the, tr- the, the body of truth changes or evolves over time, but that our understanding, clarification of, uh, of what the Bible teaches is refined or clarified from uh, generation to generation and from uh, century to century. But we contend, are to contend for that, that body of, of doctrine. So the main idea is that we are to contend for the faith. Those who, can, who maintain the purity of faith in terms of belief and application then run the race well, and they receive the prize. That focuses us on the judgment seat of Christ. Those who do not run the race well Those who fail, those who fall by the wayside, don't win the prize. It doesn't mean that they're not saved, but it means that there's a loss of reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, last time, as as I began to look at this and just summarize the uh, basic issues in in Jude, giving a a flyover, I pointed out that the the author is uh, Jude or Judas, in the, in the Greek, which is translated Judah, uh, as a translation of Judah from the Old Testament. Uh, and then there are, I pointed out, eight different individuals in the, Old Test- um, in the New Testament who are identified by the name Judas. And the only one that seems to fit this, uh, what is said, the little that is said of Jude here, and he's called Jude to distinguish him from Judas, that is Judas Iscariot, is that he identifies himself as a brother of James. If all you're going to say is um, that I'm the brother of somebody, then if it's a common name like Yahov, which is the Hebrew for James, then the James that you're uh, referring to, it must be somebody of some prominence. And the only James of some prominence was the James, uh, in, who was a leader in the church in Jerusalem, who's the author of the epistle to James, and the James that is also a half-brother to the Lord Jesus Christ. So based on uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, Jesus had two brothers who were not saved until after the resurrection, and two two of his brothers were Jude and James. And so it is more likely that this Jude is a half brother of the Lord Jesus Christ as was James, the author of the uh, uh, epistle to James. So having looked at that, uh, we learned also a little bit about Jude, that he was, um, he traveled a lot. He, uh, the apostle Paul tells us that he traveled with his, uh, with his wife, with his family. He had sons and grandsons. Hegesippus tells us that uh, the emperor Domitian felt somewhat threatened by the uh, presence of uh, his, some of his grandsons. And so they were arrested and brought before him. And uh, when it was deemed that they were merely uh, farmers, that was their intent. They weren't a threat to the emperor. Then uh, they were they were released uh, to let go. We looked at the date of this epistle, and this date comes uh, probably late in the 60s of the first century. Uh, the key issue, as we'll see again and in more detail, is what is the relationship between the writing of Jude and the writing of Second Peter? It seems more likely that the writing of Jude took place after Second Peter, and so this would put it 
uh, before, the, also was written before the fall of Jerusalem. So this would put it late, probably around 67 or uh, 68. For several reasons that Jude wrote, the first and foremost is that he wanted to uh, challenge his readers to contend for the faith. This is his primary purpose, and so he is showing why it's important to contend for the faith, the dangers of not contending for the faith in terms of the reality of God's judgment on those who promote false teaching, and the reality of, of God's judgment both in time and in eternity. Uh, he focuses on the Pre, uh, present time apostates and verses uh, 16 to 19 and then positively on uh, what they're to do for their uh, Christian growth. So the primary purpose is to contend for the faith. Secondly, he wanted to warn his readers about these apostates. So he gives them some information about them. Uh, third, he's going to uh, furnish some characteristics of what they are teaching and the apostates and what to look for so that they're spotted when uh, they, they uh, come along. Uh, in verse 4, he points out that they are uh, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness. And secondly, they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's antinomianism and a rejection of the uh, deity of Christ and the work of Christ. Uh, fourth, he will predict in verses 5 through 16 that there is a judgment upon these apostates just as certainly as God brought judgment upon uh, others who uh, interfered with his plan in the Old Testament. He mentions uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Cain, uh, Balaam, uh, others, the angelic rebellion that took place, uh, the angelic infiltration that took place uh, in, around Genesis chapter 6. Fifth, he reminds his readers of previous warnings that have been given about uh, the coming of apostasy. Verse 17, he says, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a warning that comes there. Also, incidentally, as you see, the way he structures that sentence in verse 17, you can see that he distinguishes himself. He doesn't see himself. The writer of this epistle does not see himself as part of the group of the apostles of Jesus Christ. So this indicates that he is not, uh, he doesn't view himself as an apostle, but he is part of the apostolic community so that his writing will still have uh, apostolic validation and verification uh, at this particular time. Sixth reason he wrote was to show believers how they could grow even in the midst of apostasy, that even though everything around us seems to be falling apart, even though we, as, as we even in our day look around, we see churches that are departing from the faith, that are uh, focusing on many different uh, things other and teaching many things that are not biblical, but nevertheless, uh, even though our numbers dwindle and those who maintain uh, and contend for the purity of the faith, uh, continue, continue to do so, we can still grow spiritually despite the fact that we're living in a spiritually regressive culture and uh, church culture. The seventh reason he wrote was to assure the believers that God would continue to protect them even in the midst of apostasy, that even though we see numerous churches, numerous pastors, Drifting off course, for losing sight of grace, teaching lordship salvation, teaching reform theology, teaching covenant theology, these things that get away from the truths of Scripture, that even though we see many of these things going on and we wonder uh, what is the future for sound biblical teaching, uh, God will preserve the truth because God is in charge. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And so the truth will never be uh, completely lost. Now, to whom does, does uh, Jude write? Well, there are three things I think we should note about this. First of all, he addresses these as believers. They're called beloved or sanctified. This is a textual problem in the uh, original, and so we'll have to look at that and decide whether it, we go with the King James or we go with uh, other readings. Actually, it's a difference between the majority text and the critical text, whether it's beloved or sanctified, and but they're referred to as one or the other, beloved or sanctified. That that only refers to believers in the rest of the New Testament. Either either word, uh, 
They're kept for Jesus Christ. That clearly indicates they're believers. Second, they're Jewish believers. He assumes that they have a thorough knowledge of the events that he's describing from the Old Testament. Further, he also quotes from a couple of different uh, apostate, I mean, uh, not apostate, but apocryphal sources uh, from the Old Testament. These are non-canonical sources. That doesn't mean that by quoting from them that Jude is validating what they said or that he is uh, uh, raising the, uh, their, their, uh, their level uh, to the level of Scripture. It's just that in these particular instances, those non-biblical writings have truth in them, and so what he quotes uh, is true. And so at the quoting of these uh, documents and these sayings from the apocryphal works, God the Holy Spirit validates only what is quoted as being true. And third, we know that they must be in the diaspora. They're not in Jerusalem. They're not in Judea. They are scattered out in the pagan environment of the Greco-Roman world. Now, another thing to note here is that uh, historically, Jude, First and Second Peter, James, uh, Hebrews have been classified as the general epistles. They're not Pauline, uh, they're not Johannine, they're classified as the general epistles, and they're sometimes called the Catholic epistles because they don't have a specific set group. It's not like Paul writing to the church at Colossae or Paul writing to Philemon or to Titus or Timothy. There's not a specific audience stated, so it has a, a universal uh, audience, and so they were called the Catholic epistles, which is just a, uh, a Latin word meaning universal. It doesn't mean Roman Catholic. A lot of people get confused about that. They hear Catholic, they think it means Roman Catholic. But it's, uh, these are not really Catholic or general epistles. They're Jewish epistles. They are all, most, all these are written to Jewish believers in the early church. In the early church, up into the early part of the first century, still had a predominantly Jewish uh, 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 membership. It was more and more Gentile, especially as you got further away from, from uh, uh, Judea, but uh, there was still predominantly a Jewish a group within uh, within the churches, and so they are Jewish believers who were living in the diaspora and facing various uh, problems that were uh, unique to them. Uh, living and where we see application for us is they're trying to maintain uh, doctrinal purity in the midst of a pagan uh, pagan envir- environment. Now, in terms of our understanding of the organization of the, of, the, uh, of the letter, we talked about this a little bit last time. I put a couple of different outlines up here. This is a chart out of the um, Walk Through the Bible Ministries uh, book called Talk Through the Bible. And if you notice, it uh, has it divided across the top, the basic uh, sections, the first four verses, the purpose of Jude, verses 5 through 16, which would be the main body of the epistle describes the false teachers in terms of their past judgment, present characteristics, and future judgment. (coughs) And then in verse 17, (coughs) and then in verse 17, there is a a defense uh, against the false teachers. I would state that differently. It's a positive challenge to the believers to stand firm. This is the positive part of the epistle in verses 17 to 23. And then the closing Uh, words, the closing uh, doxology of Jude. Uh, It's further subdivided in that that middle section, the divisions that would be uh, here in this area, and then uh, positively this section, verses 17 to 23, talks about the duties or responsibilities of believers. They further divide it uh, down here, the topics, reason to contend, the first 13 verses, how to contend, the second half of the epistle, the, you know, they love alliteration. That's always a sign of a good Christian ed major who learned his lesson. Uh, the anatomy of apostasy, the first 13 verses, the antidote for apostasy in the uh, second half. They date it somewhere. They have a broader date range, 66 to 80. Now, the, there's another way of l- dividing this. Uh, this is from the uh, New Grace 
uh, Bible commentary on the New Testament. The first two verses of the greeting, verses 3 and 4, state the purpose of the writing, and then you see basic similar division, uh, verses uh, 5 to 7, the uh, rehearsing the judgment of God on sin. This is why it's important to contend or stand firm for the faith. Then the false teachers, what they're teaching uh, is described in verses 8 to 16. Warnings, positive warnings to believers, encouragement to stand firm, verses 17 to 23. And then the benediction, the closing words, or doxology, verses 24 uh, through 25. This gives us a basic basic outline. And as we go through this, I'll develop and modify the outline uh, a little more than either, either one of those uh, two. Now, the next topic that I want to look at uh, in terms of the introduction is canonicity. Now, if you're trying to keep things numbered, the first was author, the second was uh, second Roman numeral, had to do with uh, the uh, objectives and uh, purpose. All right, second was date, third is occasion or purpose, the fourth was the outline we just went over, and then the fifth Roman numeral here in the introduction is the canonicity. How do we know this is part of the canon? One of the rules for determining canonicity in the early church was apostolic authorship. But we have two epistles, or actually two epistles and two other books that were not written by apostles. Luke was not an apostle, not in the same sense that Paul and others were, uh, because uh, to be an apostle you had to be chosen by Jesus Christ, commissioned by Jesus Christ, and you're also gifted with the spiritual gift of, of, of apostle. And then they are sent out to the church as a whole. But there was a second classification of apostle, and the distinction is understanding who commissioned them. And Barnabas and Junius and some others are mentioned as apostles, but these were those who were commissioned by local churches and sent on specific uh, missions by a local church. They weren't commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. So we only have uh, the 12 basic apostles, as indicated by uh, Revelation, that there are the foundation uh, stones in the future city of Jerusalem, the 12 apostles. And so this is, uh, they're the foundation of the church. So Jude and James and Luke were not uh, apostles, but they operated within the apostolic community so that what they wrote had the authority and had the uh, approval of either a an apostle, or, for example, Luke was a traveling companion of, of, um, uh, of, of Paul. Uh, another one was Mark. Mark basically writes the Gospel of Mark. Mark's not an apostle, but Mark uh, was a companion to Peter. And what Mark wrote in his Gospel is ultimately Peter's account of, of um, Jesus' ministry. And Jude and James are both associated with the uh, church in, in uh in Jerusalem and operated within that apostolic community is indicated by uh, the reference that, that Paul has to, to Jude and the other apostles in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So in terms of the canon, um, it was accepted by, in many early early stages, I pointed this out, I believe, last time, the Mertorian Canon, which was a, one of the earliest collections that we have that's still extant from about 65 to 70, uh, licit. The biggest challenge was that it seemed to be repetitive in relation to Second Peter. They cover the same things, and so there's a uh, question there uh, about redundancy. But if one, once you begin to study the two epistles together, you realize that Second Peter is warning about a coming uh, judge uh, or a coming apostasy. And Jude speaks of the fact that it is already, already present. So um, it, it seems likely that, that um, even though there are a number of commentators that take uh, Jude as being the one written first, it seems more likely that Second Peter was written afterward. Also, a number of commentators uh, take that view. The, here's a couple of charts I want to show you that show the similarity in the material between Jude and Second Peter. In Jude, verse 3, there's a similar parallel with 
2 Peter 1, 5. This parallels mostly focusing on just uh, striving for the faith or contending for the faith or pursuing uh, spiritual growth. In Jude, verse 4, there's the mention of these apostates as ungodly men who deny the Lord. In 2 Peter 2, 1, they are represented as those who will deny the Lord who bought them. Uh, Jude 6 mentions angels held in eternal chains until judgment day. This is also mentioned in uh, Jude, I mean, excuse me, in 2 Peter 2, 4. Put these passages together. We'll go back and study uh, Genesis 6 and the sons of God uh, invasion, where the sons of God take for themselves the daughters of men. And it becomes very, very clear that that can only refer to an, some sort of angelic uh, invasion of the human race with the intent of destroying the genetic purity of the human race. Jude 7 mentions the judgment of God on Sodom and Gomorrah, as mentioned also in 2 Peter 2.6. Notice how many of these references in that right-hand column are in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 2 and a little bit uh, in chapter 3. Uh, in Jude 8, talks about how the, 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 they're defiled, reject authority, slander dignitaries, characteristic of the false teachers, parallel to 2 Peter 2, verse 10. Jude 9 mentions Michael, also mentioned in 2 Peter 2, 11. Uh, Jude 10 uh, talks about the false teachers as brute beasts that speak evil. This is parallel to what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, verse 12. Jude 11 compares them to following Balaam's path, the prophet from the Old Testament, so we'll have to spend a little time going back to Numbers. Uh, 2 Peter 2.15 parallels that. Uh, Jude 12 uh, speaks of them as clouds without water. Interesting metaphor. Carried about by the winds means that there's just empty of content, devoid of content, devoid of truth. 2 Peter 2.17 imitates that. Then we have... Um, Jude 16, they grumble, complain, lust, flatter people. There's a parallel in 2 Peter 2.18. And Jude 7, verse 17, he states uh, that this is predicted by the apostles of the Lord. That parallels 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 2. Now, there's another way uh, to look at this that is in a uh, different, uh, different uh, organization. That is Jude 3 as seen in 2 Peter 1, 5, Jude 4 in 2 Peter 2, 1, Jude 6 in 2 Peter 2, 4, uh, Jude 7, 2 Peter 2, 6, Jude 8, 2 Peter 2, 10, Jude 9 in 2 Peter 2, 11, Jude 10, 2 Peter 2, 12, Jude 11, 2 Peter 2, 15, uh, Jude 12, 2 Peter 2, 13, uh, Jude 12 and 13, 2 Peter 2, 17, Jude 16, 2 Peter 2, 18, Jude 17 in um, 2 Peter 3, 2, and then Jude 18 in 2 Peter 3, 3. That's taken from a different source, and it's, uh, it's uh, very, very similar. Now, how do we explain this? How do we explain this similarity? And uh, in the, among uh, the students of, of these two books, there are three ways that you could try to explain this similarity. First explanation would be that both authors just coincidentally, accidentally, um, wrote similar epistles. That just happens in the plan of God a lot, where people just accidentally or coincidentally write the same thing. But if we believe that there is a divine plan behind the content and organization of the New Testament then this can't be an accident. There's no accidents in the plan of God. That under the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, and as the one who is inspiring uh, the uh, writings of Scripture under his ministry, we, can, we must be confident that God, the Holy Spirit, guided both writers, and therefore it's improbable that they just sort of accidentally wrote about the same thing. Uh, this was in there's an intentional reason in the mind of God for why there's such similarity between these two epistles. And that's something we need to think about. Why do we have two epistles that are so close to one another? What, is the, what are the differences? Because that's what God the Holy Spirit wants us to learn. Second uh, 
uh, way of explaining this that we find is that uh, both writers drew on a common source. This is a typical way of trying to explain things that there was some source we don't know anything about that influenced both uh, Jude and Peter. But since there's no evidence of that kind of a document anywhere, that just is an argument from silence. It's really just speculation. And so that falls short of being a good explanation. And then the third is that one was influenced by the other. In other words, either Peter read Jude or Jude read Peter, and that there is a uh, relationship uh, to the other epistle, in the, an intentional relationship in the mind of the writer. So the two options are, first of all, that Peter borrowed from Jude. That is, Jude would have written first, and then Peter came along and wrote second, having read Jude's epistle. And in um, reading Jude's epistle, he tries to expand on what Jude has said. This, uh, in this scenario, uh, Jude uh, would have been written uh, early in the decade of the 60s, somewhere between 60 to 65, and then second Peter would have been written uh, later uh, after 65, somewhere between 66, uh, 65, or 66. That kind of falls into a problem there. You don't have enough time because of when Peter uh, is martyred in Rome. So the second view is uh, probably the superior view. It gives a little more time there that Jude actually borrowed from Peter. Peter wrote early in the 60s, and uh, Jude then writes near the end of the decade, but before there is the destruction of Jerusalem and the fall of the, of the uh, temple. In fact, if you're interested in reading anything about Jerusalem uh, and, and an account of this, there's a new book that's out. It has some liberal assumptions in it in some places at the beginning. Liberal theologically doesn't really take the Bible as a best historical source and other things like that, which always bothers me to a certain degree. But it's a new book that's been... Uh, well-reviewed in numerous uh, uh, journals and periodicals called Jerusalem, a Biography, which uh, came out in, uh, I guess, the late summer or fall of 2011. And I've been reading it, and the details that are given on the what took place in AD 70 with the fall of Jerusalem and the temple are, are more than anything I've ever read before. It's just absolutely horrific. And when you understand what happened when Jerusalem fell. It would, it's virtually impossible that someone of the character of Jude or, Second, or Peter or any of the apostles would write and not mention it. It was catastrophic. It would be like talking about the, the year, uh, whatever it was, 2007, 2006, whenever it was that Katrina went into New Orleans, somebody writing... Uh, an author writing in uh, Louisiana uh, about something in that time and, and ignoring what happened with Katrina. So it, it just, you just can't imagine that t taking place at such a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic event. So it's more likely that Jude wrote after Second Peter and possibly stimulated by having read Second Peter and realizing that what Peter had had uh, forecast what Peter had warned about was now on the scene. And so Jude is warning his readers that it is, that it is now present. And so this is indicated, this, I, the, the arguments for uh, Second Peter being first, Jude second, uh, is indicated by the fact that Jude in verse 3 states, while I was uh, diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. In other words, he shows that he had an original intent to write about their common salvation, but then he changed their plans. Suddenly, he says, um, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. So there's a change in his writing plans. Uh, Peter speaks about the uh, false teachers coming using a first person, I mean, using a future tense verb, while Jude indicates that they had already arrived. In verse 4, he says, certain men have crept in unnoticed. Uh, he, does, he uses a past tense verb. A third reason why Jude follows Second Peter 
is that Jude refers to prior apostolic warnings concerning false teachers in verse 17 and 18, and that could easily refer to the warning that Peter gave in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. Fourth, Jude has a tendency, Jude's well, well read. He cites other sources. He cites uh, these other sources from the, for example, the book of Enoch, and uh, if he, which makes it likely that he would uh, have read Second Peter and possibly uh, have cited from Second Peter as well. So it's, um, uh, and, and then fifth, just a rational argument, it's more likely that a prominent apostle would be cited in a letter by someone less prominent than the other way around, than for a prominent apostle to be uh, citing from someone's writing who was uh, less well uh, less well known. Okay, that all covered the the issue related to canonicity. Uh, canonicity was uh, Roman numeral. What was that? Roman numeral five, and now Roman numeral six. Just style and language. Uh, Jude has really interesting style. He's it's obviously Jewish, but he is well. What he's he writes well in Greek. Uh, so that he uh, he's shows that he is uh, uh, very comfortable uh, as a writer in the Greek language. He has some interesting characteristics. He uses triads or triplets. He groups things in threes. Uh, there are fourteen groups of threes uh, in this epistle. Uh, for example, in the first verse, you can see it. He says, um, "To those who are called." Uh, beloved by God, sanctified by God, and preserved. Called, sanctified, preserved. That's a group of three. Then in verse 2, the only epistle that uses three characteristics in the salutation, he says mercy, peace, and love. He says mercy, peace, and love be multiplied uh, to you. Then we see various other groupings that he has. He has uh, he mentions uh, the various judgments of God upon sin in the past. He has the uh, Exodus generation, the fallen angels, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Then later in verse eleven, he cites uh, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. He describes the false teachers who've infiltrated the church as dreamers who defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. So 14 times he groups things into threes, which is, uh, uh, shows uh, something about his style. He uses 15 words in this epistle that aren't found anywhere else in the New Testament. This is the only place they're found. A few of them are found in the Septuagint, and, and uh, some of them are found uh, in more uh, classical Greek writers. But he um, he has a unique vocabulary, so his style is definitely distinct. He's not simply copying or regurgitating something he's read from uh, from Peter. Uh, Roman numeral seven. There are certain key doc- doctrines that are emphasized here. The first is the importance that he places upon contending for the faith. This is so important. Believers need to contend, but not be contentious but we need to take a stand for doctrinal accuracy and doctrinal purity and not just slide to the lowest common denominator, which is the tendency of our age. Uh, Second, there's an emphasis on accountability before God for sin and for false teaching, that there will be a judgment someday. A third doctrine that is uh, restated here is that related to the angelic invasion of the earth, Uh, with the uh, intent to destroy the genetic purity of the human race. And this is mentioned in um, Jude, verse 6. There's also an emphasis in this book on eternal security, as stated at the very beginning, that we are kept or preserved in Jesus Christ. And then in the end, verse 24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's the, so eternal security is the fourth uh, key area of doctrine here. And a fifth um, 
has to do with representing the uh, fact that this these false teachers would also come up from uh, with within the ranks and that they would have uh, an appeal to the sin nature of believers to lead them to uh, to distraction. But the solution is that believers are to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. So we contend for the faith and we're built up uh, by the faith. So all of this brings us to the uh, end of our uh, introduction and takes us into the first couple of verses as we start the exposition of the book. Now, a lot of what we'll, what we see in the first two verses we've already covered in the expo- uh, in the introduction. Now, the first verse talks about Jude as a bondservant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. So there's two parts to the opening here. Uh, the f- first is the identification of the writer, and the second is the identification of uh, the recipients, which uh, is simply stated as those who are called, uh, sanctified, or by God the Father, or preserved in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we... Look at when I look at my chart here, I cannot find the first verse which I put in here. Okay, let me skip over here to Oh, not there. Okay. The first verse, Jude as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now, this is really an interesting way in which he begins this introduction. And it applies to all the other introductions or most of the other introductions that we have in the, in the epistles of the New Testament. Jude simply identifies himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. A servant of Jesus Christ. He is a doulos. This is the Greek word that is used here. And if you notice in your... Uh, King James or New King James, it uses the term bondservant rather than slave. And you find that to be true in a lot of uh, American English translations. We have a cultural problem with the word slave coming out of our uh, out of our history and slavery in in our culture, as in the Roman culture, is the lowest rung on the social ladder. But this is exactly what the word doulos indicates. It is a word that doesn't carry with it any honor or respect in and of itself. If you are a slave, you're on the bottom of the rung of the social strata. And so Jude calls himself a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I pointed out earlier in looking at the various uh, options for identifying this Jude, there were eight in the New Testament, and the only distinguishing characteristic of this Jude is that he is the brother of James, and so that James must be identified, and is probably identified with James, the brother of our Lord, who was the leader of the church uh, in Jer- Jerusalem. He's not Judas, the Judas Iscariot who betrayed the Lord. There are some who have written in past uh, uh, eras who believe that this is the apostle Judas, uh, or Judas Thaddeus, but he was a, an apostle, not mentioned anywhere else uh, other than in the Gospels. And, uh, but because of verse 17 and the statement that, um, that Jude is making that uh, you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that this is a um, this distinguishes him. He sees himself as separate from an, an apostle. So this would only be the Jude, could only be the Jude who is the uh, half brother of the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he uses this uh, phrase, the slave of Jesus Christ, in a way that is similar to other apostles such as uh, Peter and and Paul who do this as, as well. And it may appear at first glance that these. 
uh, these opening greetings, these open, the opening address of these uh, epistles is some, something, just a formula. And I've heard people teach that. Well, this is just the way they wrote. Uh, it's like saying, uh, dear, dear Bill, uh, or to whom it may concern, this is just a formulaic statement. But that's not precisely true. When this is compared with other epistles that we have, letters that are written at that time, there are similarities, but there are also important differences. This isn't just using a boilerplate for- formula uh, either of that day or even of the of New Testament epistles. We see that there is clearly a variation. If you look at other, other addresses at the beginning of other epistles, you see that while there are a number of those who will use the phrase a slave of Jesus Christ or a servant of Jesus Christ is usually how it's translated, but it really, I want to emphasize the fact that it mean, doulos means slave, that um, it's not always stated the same way. Maybe a slave of Jesus Christ, a slave of God the Father and Jesus Christ. So the phraseology changes, uh, and it's not just a one-size-fits-all type of boilerplate uh, introduction. So there's there's usually something there that is being uh, being emphasized. Uh, when we look at this terminology of slave and come to understand something about uh, slavery in the Roman Empire, uh, this is this is quite a um, quite a thing for someone who is born a free person, a free man, to call himself a slave. Why should anyone? who has the status of a free man in Rome, which is a high status, why should they call themselves a slave? Well, there are several reasons, I think. First of all, the Old Testament background. Uh, We see Old Testament writers, the prophets or the servants of Yahweh. The first to identify himself as a servant of Yahweh is Moses. Moses uses the term a number of times. For example, in Exodus 14.31, Deuteronomy 34, 5, and Joshua 1, 1 and 2, along with uh, 15 uh, more times in Joshua, we see this phraseology of Moses is the servant of the Lord. And so this is, has, a, has, a, has an Old Testament background that the uh, a special status of authority to the one who is the servant of the Lord. Uh, which leads to the second reason, or the second uh, nuance of this term, is that in, although a slave has no status in and of himself, he is the lowest of the low. He has no authority whatsoever. If a person was a slave of a nobleman, a high official, then they were given greater honor than other slaves, and it was the honor that was attributed to the one to whom they were a slave. For example, if you were a slave of Caesar you had were given much more respect than if you were a slave of some uh, low-level uh, businessman or shop owner. So the honor is not that, that is attached to the individual is not honor due the individual slave, but is due his owner or master. In the Roman Empire, a slave is just a, a nobody uh, in, in society, but he has... Uh, status only based on his uh, on the authority of the master, and so if the master is God, then the emissary of God, who is a slave of God, slave of the Lord, has is to be given the uh, respect of one who is serving the Most High God. The third thing that we should note here is that. By saying that they are a slave of God, slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, this isn't just a statement of pseudo-humility, that they're saying, well, I'm just a nobody. They're, they're not saying it as a, a formulaic self-abdignation where they're just trying to uh, show that they're, they're, they're just not anybody special. There is something that is being emphasized here. When, you think of, when we think of a slave... We think of someone who is in a subservient relationship to someone in authority that they have on the pain of death to obey everything that that authority says. And in this case, this is someone who has voluntarily put themselves 
in a position of slavery. It is a uh, self-enforced, a voluntary position to put yourself as a slave of someone else. And there's precedent for this in the Old Testament. The Old Testament slavery, as identified and regulated in the Torah, was not a slavery like we had in the United States, but it, it is a slavery that was more like uh, indentured servitude. And in indentured servitude, at the end of a specific amount of time where you worked for the master, then you would be would have paid off your, uh, your, your cost and of whatever it was that the master had invested in you, and then you would be free. And so there was that opportunity of freedom with Old Testament slavery, but there was also the opportunity that if the person did not believe they could function or survive uh, in, in an environment of pure freedom, that they could voluntarily remain as a slave and not uh, acquire their freedom and in this case, the, the, it would be symbolized by putting an awl through the ear, having an ear pierced, as it were, uh, to indicate vol- self, uh, self-slavery, voluntary slavery. And so in, under voluntary slavery, there is an emphasis that the person has chosen uh, the master, chosen who would be, uh, to whom they would be obedient. Uh, a fourth thing that this shows in a more subtle way uh, is the authority of the writer. Uh, Jude can't say, I'm an apostle. When he says he's a servant of the Lord, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, then he is making a subtle statement about the authority that he has as a writer of this, this epistle. Now, one thing I wanted to do just as we close talking about a slave is read from a book uh, they have by Francis Lyle called uh, Slaves, Citizens, and Sons, Legal Metaphors in the Epistles. And he has quite a bit to say about, about slavery, but he makes some interesting comments about uh, being a uh, voluntary slave. He says, The clearest and most telling use of the metaphor of yielding or self-sale is found in Romans six sixteen to 22 where Paul says, Do you not know that if you yield yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Now, next time I'll come back and we'll start here and talk about Romans six sixteen to 22. But Lyle goes on to say, Yielding oneself into slavery was not necessarily a formal transaction. It was possible uh, for a free person to behave as a slave and as a result to find it impossible to assert his freedom. In Roman law, one was barred from claiming to be free if one had fraudulently pretended to be a slave. So if you had gone out and said, I'm a slave, that, that would prevent you later on from acting as a freeman. He goes on to say, um, if one had fraudulently pretended to be a slave, but there would, be, uh, would clearly be difficulties in proving that one had not acted fraudulently, and in practice the position would be that if one behaved as a slave, one was a slave. This is the kind of reasoning one finds in Jesus' words in John 8.34, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. So he goes on to say a few more things about it, and he says, as indicated earlier, there's a danger that the imagery of slavery... The use of this word doulos is taken too lightly as quaint or intriguing and romantic. Uh, Slavery was not. Self-sale was not a quid pro quo contract enforceable as such. It was slavery. So this is a very powerful word that the writers of Scripture use when they speak of themselves as a slave of Jesus Christ. So next time we come back, we'll start there. Uh, understanding the doctrine of what it means to be a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things, to uh, reflect upon the importance of contending for the faith, that there is a set body of doctrine, a body of truth that must be fought for, that must be preserved, that that's, uh, the purity of which must be maintained, and that it is up to us to contend for the faith because that is the basis of, Uh, for our spiritual growth. We grow on the basis of that faith, that body of doctrine. So, Father, we pray that you would encourage us with our understanding of the importance of doctrine and that the only way we learn doctrine is through the study of your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.